really good um, conversations going on upstairs and in this session we're going to sort of switch the angle a bit from the first session and concentrate on sort of consumers and uh, what do they want uh, what are the challenges about people um, helping people access legal services and how can um, legal businesses potentially tap into that unmet need so we've got uh, a great panel to do that um, first next to me we've got um, Professor Uzo Iwobi who is our second OBE uh, of the day um, she um, is the founder of Race Council Cymru and she's originally from Nigeria where she trained as a solicitor and barrister and was called to the bar and then um, moved over to Wales um, we would be here all day if I ran through every post and every project you've gone through, um, but that includes, she's been a law lecturer at Swansea, been on the police national diversity team based at the Home Office, and also was a commissioner um, at the then known Commissioner for Racial Equality. Um, then next we have um, Nathan Vadini, who is a solicitor and founder and director of Ultra Law. Um, he's an employment law specialist, but Outra Law is a really interesting firm as it's the UK's first not-for-profit um, firm and they're based in um, just down the road in Caerphilly. So it's going to be really interesting to hear from Nathan about how that model works. He's previously worked in big law firms, but um, I'll be interested to hear um, how a not-for-profit firm works. Then next um, to Nathan, we have Sarah Watson, and she works for the Solicitors Regulation Authority alongside me. Um, but she's a risk analyst, and she leads our um, research team. And she recently led on our research, which I mentioned earlier, um, working with Oxford University into legal, um, legal technology and innovation. And previous to working at the SRA, she worked in um, the Legal Ombudsman and also in academia. And then finally, at the end, we have Michael Hanney, who is CEO and founder of Review Solicitors, which is a review site that works with around 2,000 law firms to help the public access information around different law firms and sort of the, the quality of law firms. And he's previously worked in um, senior roles at Specsavers as well as quality solicitors. And it will be really great to hear Michael's insights, but probably in the interest of fairness, I should say, other review and comparison websites are out there. In fact, we've been running, you, um, Liz mentioned about our unbundling pilot earlier on. We've actually, um, since the start of this year, been running a pilot with around 70 law firms, a number based in Wales, and um, nine comparison websites to look at what role can comparison websites help in helping consumers um, make informed choices around legal services. And also, that pilot is not only about looking at how we can perhaps encourage that, but also what are some of the barriers there? What are some of the things you might get around, such as uh, risks around things like fake reviews? So I'm sure we'll be coming on to discuss some of that um, in a bit. So let's crack on. And I, a bit like the first session, I've got an opening question for each of our panellists, which um, we'll go along and answer. I've got a few more questions, but again, I'd really love it if we, um, we had some excellent questions in the first session, if we can get out to you as soon as possible. But the first question I wanted to ask us, um, what do people want when it comes to legal services and how do consumers choose legal services? So if I come to you first, Uzo. Okay, that's interesting. Thank you so much for the very warm welcome. Um, the charity that I established in Wales is, uh, one of them is Race Council Cymru, which is like an umbrella body that promotes race equality. For many uh, of our elders in the Windrush elders and the black history community, as well as the small diverse grassroots groups like the Chinese community, the Filipinos, Bangladeshis, spread right across the whole of Wales, um, how, they how they engage solicitors, strangely, to my knowledge, is word of mouth. And it's very, very strange because you would think somebody might Google and say, who's the best solicitor? But people always go by, who do people recommend have been good? Who has a good reputation of delivering an excellent service? So I know that there was one incident, uh, for example, our Chinese in Wales Association is one of the organizations in Cardiff and Swansea. And their leader talked about one example of having an excellent ex uh, experience working with a law firm that law firm got over 15 different clients because of that one recommendation. And they don't mind waiting in queues because they've heard that somebody else experienced a really good, um, had a good experience. Likewise, if you've had a bad experience with one solicitor's firm, 
it travels right across. It may be unfair. You may feel that people misjudged you and the circumstances were different, but ethnic minority people, to my experience, are very persuasive to each other. So if anybody comes, oh, they're terribly racist, don't go there. So you might feel this is so unfair, you're not racist, it was a difficult situation, but word of mouth is remarkably powerful for ethnic minority people. So make an effort to um, share what you can do, what you can offer. If you have any good news stories, put them on your website, put images, it really encourages people. Also, people who provide services with zero force. So don't use too much <laughs> technology because a lot of our elders struggle with digital inclusion methods of working. During this pandemic, we've really struggled to get elders on Zoom to even talk to them about you know, providing ordinary support. People who've had issues prefer to have somebody next to them who they trust, who can help um, translate. They believe that law, the legal language is very complex and, and set there to confuse individuals, um, you know, innocent individuals in the community. So they often trust a lot of their leaders, um, especially the ones who, for whom English isn't a first language. So always explore how you can break things down really simply for some. Obviously, we can't generalize because many diverse ethnic people are lawyers themselves and come from families where they can inspire and inform. But I'm talking about the general, um, you know, first generation or second generation migrants. I think the easier you can make it, the better. Thank you, Uzi. That was really interesting. What about you, Nathan? What do you think? I think um, when it comes to choosing legal services, uh, people look for, especially when it's a personal legal service, a relationship. So I think fundamentally it comes down to building that relationship uh, having a trusting relationship. I completely agree with you, though, that on certain aspects of uh, consumer law, if we're going to call it that today, um, I think personal recommendation is key. So whether it's a commoditized area of law like conveyancing, uh, or whether it's a more personal one, family law, um, personal injury, uh, crime, criminal law in my practice area, which is employment law, people want that empathetic, understanding approach. Um, I think communicating to them and navigating them through a legal problem is very important. So they, they want an answer to their legal problem. I'm going to cite Clive's lovely uh, mantra, which is problem solved, and I think he's, he's kicked it right, uh, right well, correctly there in terms of why people come to you in the first place. So well done, Clive. <laughs> it's a shame we can't all steal it. But, but from my perspective, um, people want someone they can trust. Um, people do choose solicitors still over other lawyers in a wider sense because they have that stamp of authority, they have that stamp of recognition and regulation, so I don't think that's going to change. Um, in terms of how they choose their legal services, which one, there's a plethora of options obviously available. People generally do look at review websites, um, they do go to that firm's websites, but again, agreeing with Uzo, um, when it comes to the personal choice of, of services which affect you fundamentally in your life, they want that personal recommendation. So myself as an employment lawyer, I only act for individuals and I get every single one of my clients through personal recommendations. So we don't market at all at the moment. If we did, we'd be in trouble, frankly, because we don't have the resources to service that, which is a lovely problem to have. Uh, but we want to make sure that our service levels are um, the top notch you'll get all the time. So five star reviews, 100% recommendation by clients. We are new to the legal market and we're gonna be a disruptor. So that means by necessary that uh, people will seek to look for reasons not to choose us so therefore we have to be 100% um, service focused at the moment um, and we, we change the way that we provide legal services as well I think that's something which consumers are looking for uh, more and more so we meet their needs where they are whether they want to meet in person uh, generally with the older generations wills trust probate they still like to meet in person whether I'm acting for as I did yesterday a gentleman sitting uh, on the east coast of, of America he wants a zoom conversation because he can't meet me face to face or where the telephone is as most people come uh, people want to have their needs met exactly where they are at that time um, and for me it's about um, fundamentally for a firm to meet that it's about enabling your lawyers to do that so how do you enable your lawyers to do that well very controversially in outer law we don't have 
uh, billing targets for our lawyers. So our lawyers are then liberated to help the clients in the best way that they can. We're a law firm, we will make money. We charge clients um, a, a, an expensive rate for our services. So we make sure that our lawyers are given everything they can to help those clients. Thank you, Nathan. It's going to be really interesting sort of digging into the bones of how this not-for-profit mod model works. I'm sure people will be interested. Sarah, the SRA does quite a lot of research into looking at how c consumers behave and what, 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 what they want. What sort of insights have we gained through that? Um, so communication um, is a thread running through various uh, research and, uh, and data and a, a thread that's coming through today um, as well, I think. Um, and the research shows that's because people and small businesses and, and businesses of various sizes want their needs to be understood um, and because they want to know the work that's going to be done, uh, when that will be done and at what cost. Um, and for example, complaints data shows that most service complaints boil down to communication, whether that's about progress, costs or, or the advice itself. Uh, the consumer panel's annual survey shows that many people choose their legal service provider based on those words of mouth recommendations. Um, and that gives them a sense of the reputation of the firm, which is the, the sort of highest factor across the board in what people are looking for when they're choosing um, their solicitor or other legal services provider. But that, and there is an increasing proportion of people who are looking online when they need to find legal, legal help. Um, and different people want different things, um, of course, and they need or they want different methods of communication, as, uh, as Nathan was, was saying as well there. Um, for instance, the Consumer Panel Survey, again, found that many people have been satisfied with meeting virtually um, over the last 20-odd uh, months, um, but still, uh, some people do still want face-to-face -face contact. Um, and our past research has found that solicitors are the ones that are best placed uh, to know what each of their clients uh, want and that people really appreciate being asked about their needs and being asked about their preferred method of communication. Um, and research has also found that people have benefited um, from being able to find information online uh, to help them make informed choices when they're looking for a legal services provider. Um, in terms of choosing the, the providers, there are obviously variations by practice area, by region. Um, for example, Welsh um, consumers are more likely to choose uh, based on recommendations than English consumers. Um, and local and convenient services are slightly more important to, to Welsh consumers than English consumers. Um, and the LSB as well found that people in Wales are more likely to use a solicitor as their main advisor uh, compared to, to England. Um, in terms of uh, thinking about how we, we are innovating as a, as a research team and as a regulator as a whole, um, one of our regulatory objectives is to increase access to justice or to improve access to justice. Um, and we're trying to be more innovative to meet that objective. For example, the piloting um, that's been spoken about today, um, it'll give us, give us more evidence for us and the sector to, to progress uh, with that regulatory objective. Um, and we want to better understand the needs of different people in different regions um, across Wales and England. Um, so soon we'll be starting some more research um, to, to give us that um, better grounding and better sort of uh, evidence base. Thank you, Sarah. And then, Michael, you're trying to tap in, I suppose, to the m moving beyond the word, word of mouth, aren't you, in terms of and this shift perhaps to more people looking online. So what we, what's your insight on how consumers are choosing legal services? Sure. So um, Review Solicitors, we're a, a legal review platform. Um, we list every single law firm in the country. Um, what we've seen is over the last five years or so, there is an expectation from clients to be able to um, get more information about a potential experience with a solicitor. Um, word of mouth recommendations, you know, they've, they've been around for forever. Um, and I'm not suggesting that, uh, you know, they're, they're dying out or anything like that. But even with a word of mouth recommendation, people still want to be able to go on to um, online and be able to look at a firm's website and also to be able to read um, more information about the potential experience that they're going to have. Um, we have seen an increase in the amount of people that are coming on to the Review Solicitors platform. So often, you know, they'll 
they may already have a firm in mind about, you know, I'm potentially looking at, at using ABC law because, you know, I've spoken to my dad and he said that, you know, they were good five years ago when they used them. Um, but it, it really comes down to giving people the ability to, to choose which way and which direction they want to go. Um, so I think it is important for, um, you know, for, for firms to, to be able to understand what it is that clients want when they're, when they're at the early stage of the client journey. Um, and if, you've, you know, if you think about it yourself, if you, you, you probably have you know, friends in, in different areas um, that you can go to for advice, but it, it's interesting to, to look at it from somebody who doesn't have that, so somebody who doesn't have any, any form of recommendation, you know, where's the first place that they're going to go? Uh, you know, I've, I've seen people asking questions on, on Facebook quite openly, you know, does anyone know a good employment solicitor? You know, that's how, how desperate some people are at the early stage of the client journey, and it, it's trying to what we're doing at Reviews List is, is trying to give people that ability to be able to you know, research themselves and you know, validate the, the firm that they're looking to, to trust. And it's an interesting point. And just one thing I wanted to pick up. Is your sense that m more people are on your website with a view to, I want to check this, a check a firm that I've heard a bit about to see whether they're decent or they've got disastrous reviews? Or are there quite a few people arriving there with zero idea and just, what, what, is it, one or the other or well i mean it's, it's a good mix of the both um so you know we, you know being an, an open market platform a whole of market platform um we give people the ability to you know show me all of the solicitors in cardiff and you know who can help me with with employment law so you have people who are who don't have that recommendation who you know use the reviews to to form their decision about which way in, uh, in which they're going to go um, but you get a lot of uh, clients who you know want to do their own research you get a lot of people who you know i'm thinking about using this firm and they may have even spoken to the firm already or, or had a sit down face to face but they want to go away and do their own research and that's what reviews allow them to do it allows them to validate the firm that they're looking to use that's great and so the, i had a follow-up question we've sort of touched upon it a little bit but how is how is that sort of what consumers want? How has it changed perhaps in the last decade, but also where, where, where is it heading? Is it, it, does anyone want to kick off on, on that question? I don't mind kicking okay, off. We'll go, Nathan, we'll we'll take we'll take go to Nathan, then, <laughs> then Michael. <laughs> um, I, think, I think there has been a fundamental shift over the last decade about how people choose legal services and just the amount of information that's out there. So. Um, Consumers are much more savvy these days. They will do their own due diligence, especially if it's a personal legal service that they're after. So they will look on comparison websites. And you mentioned validation. I think that's exactly right. Uh, legal 500, Chambers and Partners as well, I think, are good for people, even if they don't understand what that actually means, to see that there are external bodies who say nice things about them. Testimonials of websites are used more and more these days. Um, a law firm without a website is basically going to be a, a dying breed. Um, I only know one, and uh, yes, they, they don't get anything apart from personal referral. I don't Can I think ask a question? Does, any, yeah. does everyone here have a website who's a law firm? Is anyone who's the dying breed that Nathan <laughs> refers to? Or do you want Sorry. to admit to being the dying breed? <laughs> so does everyone have a website, yeah? Yeah, so I think that, that tally is what you say. Yeah. But I don't think the personal recommendation will, will stop. I think that uh, that will always be there. Um, other types of legal services that are chosen, perhaps with different things in mind. You have comparison websites for conveyancing, for example, and I fear that conveyancing is a commoditized service, that it's a race for the bottom. Um, now, a lot of people wouldn't choose uh, the cheapest option because, uh, like, like NASA, everything uh, that's been built in that spaceship that we're sending up to space has been delivered by the person who gave the lowest quote in. That doesn't give you the confidence <laughs> that that is the right uh, mechanism you should be using to, to go into outer space. But from my perspective, if I'm choosing someone, I don't choose the cheapest because you have an indication that they may not give you the best service. So you may go into a comparison website, you may choose uh, not the cheapest, but two or three up from there, then go onto their websites and see what other sorry, uh, clients say about them, then go onto review solicitors and see that. So for me, it's not one touch point anymore, it's a lot of different ones. Um, and I think the days of lawyers being their ivory towers, having people come to them are definitely at an end, certainly on the consumer standpoint. Um, and I, I think reviews are going to be of more and more importance um, as we progress over the next few years.
Michael, you had something you wanted to say about that. And then we'll yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd just following on from that. So, you know, we've we've positioned review solicitors to be uh, not price focused. Um, so essentially, it's not a, a race for the bottom from from our perspective. Um, you know, I, I quite early on cottoned on to the fact that nobody wants to you know race to the bottom because you're not making any money. Um, and what we're trying to do is help to educate um, clients at the early stage of the client journey to understand that there is a, a difference in the quality of solicitor that you're going to get. And that's really, really important because uh, you know, it, often you know, legal services could be a, a distress purchase. You know, nobody wants to be spending money on lawyers if you don't have to. And um, from, from a client's perspective, you know, there, there is almost a mentality to go, all right, I'm, I'm, I, want to, I don't really want to have to pay for this, so I'm going to go for the cheapest. Um, but that won't generally get the client the result that they're looking for. You know, they won't have the, the high standards um, that, that they expect because at that point they're thinking every solicitor is the same. Um, so, you know, they might, not, they might expect to be able to have, you know, I pick the phone up and I can speak to my solicitor, but that's actually not the case. You know, you're going to be leaving a message and, and getting a call back later on. So, you know, it's helping clients to understand that, you know, there is a, there is a difference in the quality of the solicitor that, that they're looking to get and reviews form a, a kind of evidential um, social part of that, um, which I think we all kind of rely on ourselves. You know, if you look at other things, you know, you're booking a hotel or you're going on holiday, you, you want to be able to understand the experiences that other people have had so you don't make those mistakes. And clients wouldn't be using a solicitor in the first place if they could do it themselves. So, you know, you get lots of people who are at that stage and it's just essentially reviews provide that education and that validity. So did you have something to add to that? Yes, I did. Interestingly, um, reflecting on the, some of the conversations we've had in the community when it came to uh, selecting where you would go or which law firm you'd use, depending on your income bracket, um, I would say that most of our local grassroots communities will always go for the cheapest. They negotiate, they will haggle to the inch of their lives. If you say, if you say your fees, let's say 200 pounds for writing a letter, they'll say, well, why can't you do it for 100? Because if you do it for 100, I'll bring five other relatives who will also support you and you can charge them your full price. But for me, who's bringing everybody else, you better give me a discount. We love discounts in our community, I'm sorry. Um, if you do, if you're dealing with people who are probably earning much more, they might probably fit into the categories that you were talking about in terms of looking at maybe ne cheapest isn't necessarily best. But I would say for a good percentage of our elders, they definitely will want the cheapest. And I, I've heard an elderly lady saying to her son, you haven't looked properly, that's too expensive. Go and look for cheaper ones because they're all solicitors, they're all they're all doing the same thing. We just need somebody with a, a fancy letter headed paper and put what we want and that's it. Don't get big prices here. We don't want big prices. So I would say go for your, um, if you were dealing with uh, our community members who had that idea, everybody likes the sense of a bargain. So if your fee was going to be 200, start to have 300 and say, but I'm giving you a hundred pound discount. And then they feel, oh yeah, I got something off and you still get your fee. Well, that's what some people would say. But yeah, we come from a culture, especially in Nigeria, where we haggle a lot. We like the concept of haggling. You like to feel like you got something discounted or somebody liked your business enough to discount even 50 pounds off. They feel like yeah, I want to go back to that person because they, they understand and they're willing to negotiate. So it's a completely different mindset, I think, to look at white, white people, you know. I wouldn't generalize in any way, but I'm telling you the tips that I've heard in my community when they talk about, you know, who, who are they going to sign up with. I think it's a really, a really interesting point. And Nathan, you picked up, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to your clients. And I was actually speaking to a group of neurodiverse consumers the other week, and actually nearly all of them said, I want the option, tech really appeals to me, and I don't want to have to deal with phone calls, because actually neurodiversity often, you, conversation or sort of social interaction when you don't know someone can feel quite, quite something that's quite a big barrier to get through. But actually that approach might not work at all for, uh, for someone else. So I think this identifying what your client needs is really important. Can I just ask you one question, Nuzu, and then I'll perhaps um, come, come to the rest of the panel. You said that you'd been trying to get um, 
the elderly members of, sort of communities on Zoom and try and get that more in tech. Has that worked at all? Has there been any shift or is it not really happened? Some of them have improved significantly. I think Welsh Government realised the need to particularly reach out to ethnic minority elders and during the pandemic, especially when many of them were cut off from their families, some were very agitated, they hadn't seen people for months, so there was a real effort to talk them, get them on the phone and talk them through pro provided iPads and things to, to get people more online. Um, I'm not sure how widely that worked because, for example, with the Windrush elders, we have 66 uh, members on a WhatsApp and only about five or six would come on, on Zoom. So you'd have to phone all the others mm. to check that they were okay. So they just weren't confident using, you know, computers and laptops. They needed family members or community leaders or friends to come and help them get online. Or sometimes they'd come online and heads would be missing and arms mm. would be sticking up and cups of tea would be right in the camera, you know. but. It's interesting uh, mm. that we never give up. We keep encouraging them, and now things are opening up more. Um, they are wanting to learn in case we go into another lockdown. So the resilience in, in, of spirit for people, especially some of our Bangladeshi communities whose first language is in English, trying to work, understand all those keys is, is really daunting. Mm. So I would say that accessing solicitors by digital means may not be something many can access but they would want their children who are you know advanced in knowledge or, or, or academia to help them and talk through and also firms that provide translation services you know like the chinese community they ask can, will you have translators in your firm who can speak either mandarin or cantonese to translate for their business owners and interestingly if they if they don't have a translator, how would they feel if somebody uses tech to track? Because tech obviously has great potential to actually translate into any language. Mm. Is that something that's going to fly? Or people going to go, no, I don't want a computer I, speaking I, to me? I think what they've been using is language line, or they have actually, the community have provided the translator, but the firm charges for it. Okay. You know, charges the clients okay, to provide Okay, so then one. the cost is yeah. passed, passed on, which if you ask someone, do you want to pay more or do you want to have a yeah. A computer translate. That, yeah. That's really interesting. Just so you mentioned WhatsApp. Does anyone use WhatsApp to communicate with clients here? Yes. Yeah, we've got a few. And does anyone is anyone brave enough if we get um, a microphone? Does anyone want to explain how does that? Why you made that choice and does that work well? Does anyone? There was two women at the back and you there. Do you? Yeah, do you want to? So why do you, why do you use what WhatsApp? So if you get Liz just down here at the front. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I, I. We we use WhatsApp for uh, mostly our corporate commercial clients, but also some family clients because if they have businesses, they don't. Uh, we've got a few that don't check emails daily. Um, they also don't really know how to use things like Microsoft Teams or Zoom, but they can use their smartphone. So we find that actually we tend to get a quicker response from a lot of clients via WhatsApp because it's what they use with their friends and family. Does it help as well that you can see whether they've read it or not? That <laughs> does help from my perspective, <laughs> yeah. uh, but obviously you can also send pictures, documents and things via WhatsApp as well. So that, again, that helps them and for us we just get a very, very quick response compared to email. Did anyone at the back want to add anything as to why they use WhatsApp? Yep. Um, so. I think what we had there, just in case anyone couldn't hear that, is a, yeah, a similar reason, that sort of, sort of interaction. Um, so going on to that, I, Sarah, I, we were talking about yeah, what consumers are going to want in the next decade. Is there going to be a greater shift towards technology, do you think? So I've spoken to younger people who say, actually, I would be my first priority using a law firm would be that they have an app or something like that, which is totally different to um, the, the elder generation who's talking about. Where do, where do you think things are heading? Um, well, the Oxford research um, looked at what firms are providing um, at the moment and where the, the future trends are there. Um, and from there, we could see that, the, that there seems to be potential for growth in terms of um, more tech being used to, to market and uh, to clients and to, to onboard um, new, new clients. 
um, which is, that, that's definitely a, a growth area. Um, so it's, it's not used so much by, by firms at the moment, whereas a lot of tech is used for, you know, the business processes, um, in internal kind of work systems. Um, I think it goes to what Mike was saying as well in terms of we're all consumers um, and in general we are using tech more and more um, to um, either completely solve a problem or um, buy services or products or to supplement and sort of validate our choices. Um, obviously not, not in all cases but increasingly so and the research um, does show that people are more and more so that the trend is definitely moving in that direction for, for tech to be used um, to validate it, if nothing else. Um, and do you think there's an, and this is for anyone on the panel, do you think there's an increasing expectation that a law firm or a business is available effectively 24-7, so you, there's web chat or chatbots or various things you can do that basically, or even WhatsApp puts it in the hand of, I'll respond when it's convenient to me. Do you think that is a, do people think, is that a shift in terms of consumers' expectations? Nathan, you're nodding your head. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think consumers uh, do require you now to always be on. And fundamentally, that causes a problem that I see for law firms and in particular lawyers. Now, everyone knows figures for uh, lawyers and burnout are going through the roof. And, and I think that's one of the issues. So using tech to address that instead is certainly a way to keep your lawyers' well-being, health at front and centre, make sure that they are fresh in your core hours, whatever they may be, to help your clients and do their job. And outside of that, I know a number of law firms that actually um, uh, outsource their tech bots, effectively, or live chats with scripts and with service level agreements that those companies have so that they're able to effectively be the law firm, but outside of it itself. So for me, uh, the always on culture, I, I rebel against myself <laughs> and I, I don't like it. But for my clients, I meet their needs. And if someone is uh, WhatsApping me on a Sunday and I know that a quick answer from me is going to stop them having a, a minor heart attack, um, then of course I'm going to respond there and then. But um, I'm bringing up a whole bunch of young lawyers and I'm telling them that's not the way to do things. Um, so it's, it's a bit of a, a contradiction in that. But technology for me is going to be a big answer to that. Anyone else want to add to that? I think life is moving forward, honestly. Children today, what they're able to do is incredible. I went to do a diversity talk in a school, with a primary school with little four, five-year-olds coming in and going straight onto an iPad that's set up, using their fingers to pick their lunches and pick what they want here. And absolutely every one of them, the little kids, um, from all backgrounds, Pakistani backgrounds, they were just, and I said, do you do this every day? Oh, yes, yes, we do this every day. So I think the change is happening in technology for uh, young people. I mean, we have something called the National Black Asian Minority Ethnic Youth Forum for Wales, 250 young people, Somali, all sorts of young, they're all into tech. And so if there was a problem, they would totally not think twice about, they wouldn't feel like their, their grandparents feel or their parents. They would definitely want to communicate with the lawyer using you know, email, tech, whatever app you have, they're all switched on. So it depends on the clientele and the age group. You know, I think definitely it's going to become increasingly the way forward um, that more people are communicating. Online chats on apps, is really, really attractive. They ask questions. You know, there was that uh, device, something called Ask Jeeves. At the oh, time. Right. Do you remember oh, that yeah. old The glory thing? days. Yes, oh, right. but it's moved on now and people can chat to lawyers and find out quick answers mm. before they decide whether to book with you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned web chat. We at the SRA actually have web chat for our ethics helpline. I don't know whether people know about the ethics helpline, but it's effectively there for solicitors. If you've got an ethical problem or you're having difficulty, one of the big things we say at the SRA is get in touch with us, because actually often when something, what, what the worst thing that can happen is someone buries their head in the sand and things get out of control and then it ends up being more problematic. But actually we introduced the web chat and people really liked using the web chat because they could sort of, it being controlled, but also it can feel quite personal phoning up about an ethical issue and that allowed that sort of 
the, the distance of getting the written answers. Uh, does anyone here use a web chat for their clients or a chat bot? Mm. Yeah, so we've got two. Do you, do you, would you like to share why you use um, a, a web chat? We're very uh, client focused. That really is the main objective and then everything else then centers around uh, client service. Generally speaking, a lot of the web chats um, generally is things like, um, how do I make an appointment? How do I pay you money? Um, do you do criminal work? Do you do this? So you can field most of it, even though it's 24-7. You, you, know, you can feel most of it yourself or with automated answers and put their mind at rest. They think they've had an amazing experience and maybe you've paid 15, 20 quid for that per day um, to be able to provide that service. And have you so you haven't outsourced it, you're running it within the firm? Uh, we've got a combination. So we, um, there's a number of us that have logins. So if we're sitting one evening, if I'm surfing looking for a holiday, I'll have it in the background. So obviously if it pops up, I can just quickly answer it. Yeah. But then if it's not answered, it then does go to a service provider that we pay to, um, to be able to respond to it. And generally it's, I'll take all your details and somebody will ring you in the morning. And that pacifies them. They feel that they've had an amazing service. And again, it's relatively cheap. They feel they've had an amazing experience and uh, you've serviced that need. Any tips for anyone, anyone here who might be thinking, well, oh, maybe a web chat might be good for my business? I would say, I, I would definitely explore because um, that is the client's expectations. But an interesting um, observation listening to the panelists is that um, I was at an event uh, many, many months ago, and one of the things that inspired me was a lawyer actually saying that an individual can't give great service 24-7, 100% of the time, but a great team can. So we have team mailboxes. So instead of having burnout with one lawyer, we actually have a team of people, and quite often it doesn't actually require a lawyer to respond. It could be easily something. We have, through the pandemic, we've capitalized on the fact that a lot of our staff want flexible working. So what that then dovetails into is the fact that because they want flexible working, they're not necessarily working the core nine to five hours. So we've got a number of staff that work the core nine to five hours, but the people that want that flexible working, that's then dovetailed into providing a greater coverage for client service. So it's a win-win. They get the work-life balance. Um, our lawyers don't get burnt out, hopefully. And uh, clients get exceptional service. That's the plan. Brilliant, thank you. You've definitely earned your lunch today, so thank you for uh, that. That is really, really helpful. Um, Nathan, perhaps I could come to you, because I imagine we haven't dug into sort of how a not-for-profit firm actually works. So just want to say, how, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, absolutely. So hopefully most people know how a law firm works. Well, you have clients, you charge them fees, you make profit. And law firms historically were partnership models. And so the people at the top of the tree had equity and they took the lion's share of the profits of the business. So after you pay your uh, overheads, uh, your rent, your other lawyers, etc., then what's left over is profit. Um, there's been a move very recently um, towards uh, other organizations running the law firm, or at least owning the, uh, the law firm, so private equity companies, shareholders in different companies. I was with Russell Jones and Walker when it was taken over by Slater and Gordon lawyers, and there was a fundamental shift internally about making the finances of the company work and reporting constantly on that, um, something which I rebelled against at the time because for me, front and center is helping the client. That's why I got into law. It sound, may sound a little trite, but I got into law to help people, and that's what I do. I will make money, as I said, because I'm a lawyer. So as a business, um, if you are selling legal products and if you're pricing it correctly, and if you have the demand, then you will make money. So for me, um, I don't like to use the word ethical um, in this sense, but it is an ethical choice. So rather than the people at the top of the tree keeping all the money, um, frankly, um, fat, rich lawyers getting fatter and richer. Um, it's about uh, liberating that so that the people in society who really need it uh, have the money instead. So in essence, it's a wealth distribution model. So what we do is we take a very wealthy industry and we say, rather than making rich people even richer, let's give that to people who need it more instead. So who decides who gets the profit? Uh, that's our clients. So um, we have uh, lots of clients and lots of referrers. So referrers also have an opportunity to 
say where the profits go. Well, at the moment, we're doing it on a case-by-case -case basis because we're still relatively small. We're intentionally keeping small. We're not doing any marketing uh, to make sure that our service levels remain very, very high. Um, but on every case, we ask a client, where do you want the profits from your particular instruction to go? Now, over time, you will be able to differentiate um, for example, our will, trust and probate division have different profit margins to our employment division. But if we start off from an assumption, which is what we do now, 10% of what you pay us gets given to a charity of your choice. Every single client chooses their own charity. And people have different ethical itches. So one person may want to help a local food bank, another person may have uh, a particular interest because of a, a family issue in cancer research, for example. Everyone has different things, and that shows the diversity of a quarter of a million charities registered in the UK. Uh, we've taken away the regu regulatory obligation of that by saying it has to be a registered charity in the UK. But as time goes on and we grow, we'll be able to then say we can help any social enterprise that actually needs it if you want to nominate that one. So large charities are often chosen, but I get very inspired by the small charities that are chosen. And I p personally have a passion for helping small, thriving charities uh, doing new things to address things like mental health. So, um, yeah, not-for-profit basically means we make money, but we give it all away rather than um, keeping it ourselves. Oh, brilliant. Uh, really interesting. I'm going to come out to the floor in a second. I'm just going to ask Michael uh, one question. I think this is a question for you. Is comparison websites and review websites in terms of the legal sector, it probably hasn't grown as quickly as it has in other sectors. What, what, why, why do you think that is? Is there a blocker there, and is that changing? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, when I originally came up with the concept of Review Sisters about seven years ago, you know, it took a couple of years to, to get off the mark, but I think we were a little bit early to market by a couple of years. Um, I don't think that there was um, the passion there from the legal sector to think, all right, I'm going to give clients the opportunity to, to leave a review about my service. You know, what, what does a client know? You know I'm the expert. You know? um, so I think there was a little bit of hesitation, um, especially when it came to you know, the risks involved with, you know, defamatory reviews or reviews from people who were not, not clients of the firm. And I think, um, you know, we, we've got things in place in order to, to deal with those um, types of reviews. Um, but I think, you know, the technology's moved on quite a bit as well. Um, you know, we've automated um, the review collection process. So, you know, we've worked with law firms of all shapes and sizes from sole practitioners to, you know, top 200 firms. Um, to, to automate the review collection. So that's the ability to you know, not have to have a manual intervention to, to remember to send an email out to a client asking them to, to leave you a review. Because I think you know, if you're having to do it yourself, sometimes you're a bit put off and you know, you, you'd rather be fee earning or you know, you've got 101 other things to do. Um, so I think you know, technology's moved on quite a bit and you know, we're starting to see, to see a shift now from, um, f from people not really wanting to collect reviews or, or just, you know, the, the initial firms that want to give it a shot to, to it being more of a broader concept. Um, and I think that that's also been driven by the fact that there is an expectation now from clients that they're able to read um, about, you know, your service levels and about how other clients have experienced, um, you know, or have gone through a similar sort of process and, and how was that, you know, how communicate, what was the communication like with my solicitor? And I think, you know, if we, if we think about it, you know, legal services is generally, in my experience, been quite slow to adopt new technology. But when clients are, are using it in, in other industry sectors, you know, they're using it to, to you know, book a holiday, book a hotel, um, you know, that, that expectation is being driven by the consumer to just basically get more information at that time. And it, consumers are pretty savvy, aren't they? So reviews are never going to be the be-all and end-all. I know if I go on TripAdvisor to choose a hotel, if there's loads of five-star reviews or there's loads of one-star reviews, I'll often sort of learn to take with a bit of a pinch of salt the ones at either end. And sometimes I'm actually more interested in the three- and four-star reviews, which might suggest. Mm. And pe consumers don't yes, necessarily see a bad review and think, well, I'm never lose using that firm. No, and, and, and that's quite a good point. So I think we've all got an element of self-filtration when it comes to reading reviews. You know, you don't just look at one review and you think, all right, that's the service. You know, you look at everything. And when you start to get into, um, 
into actually reading, especially you know the, the longer reviews, you can start to form a judgment as to whether this person's you know a little bit crazy or they're just wanting a bit of a rant. Um, but you know it's it com it comes down to the fact that you know review we're all using reviews all of the time. You know you want to buy a car, you're using a review, uh, and it's interesting to know some of the pitfalls. You know people will start you know people want to be helpful. That you know it's a community um, that leave reviews, and people want to help other people. So you know it's essentially allowing. Um, you know, if, if you're a law firm, it's allowing yourself to be able to, you know, essentially read the reviews yourself as if you were looking at using the firm and to think, well, actually, you know, if I was reading this, what would I think? If I've just got one or two reviews, it's a bit of a problem. But if I've got 30 or 40 reviews, you can start to get a more thorough understanding of the service level. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, can, we, can we go out to the floor? Have we got any questions from the audience? Emma, do you, uh, mm -hmm. if we get the um, microphone there. Um, it just, I, I wondered how many law firms in the room put on their website that they are client-focused, client high quality. It's not a criticism if you do. Do you want to hide hands yeah. up for yeah, this hands question? Up. Yeah, hands up. You can yeah. come sit up here and share. Oh, no, 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 no. Hands up. So who puts client-focused? So words similar to that yeah. that we so we've got, we've we've got one at the back and that's the, with the web chat we've got. <laughs> okay, yeah, so a few, yeah. My point is that I suppose re reviewing is part of the evidence in what you say and it's picking up on what Chris was saying earlier is why are you in business? Why, why do you do what you do and who do you do it for? And if you um, market yourself as client focused, high quality, whatever that means, but we, you know, we, we're really passionate about delivering a strong service and we know who our clients are, you wouldn't be scared of reviews because the majority of the time you'd hope you would deliver that because you really have identified yourself well um, and equally if you do use those terms loosely on your website maybe you should think again <laughs> I suppose that's a, you know kind of a point so I think it's it's really good that I, I, I don't think I think reviews are part of the piece aren't they but um, it's good that, that that it's coming more to the fore um, because most websites you'll see testimonials and I think it's probably the same thing isn't it it's just being a bit bolder um, yeah, and I think uh, you know, most, most people in Wales can deliver a good service, so why not? Um, but does anyone here also use review? Any, not, not just review solicitors, but like trust, um, uh, any kind of review Yeah, trust pilot, or is anyone yeah. else using review? Does anyone encourage people to put reviews on? Compact? Yes, it's Clive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do, should, should we hear from you? How, how is that experience for you then putting, Sorry. engaging with comparison websites, this gentleman here? So we, we actually own a comparison website for conveyancing, okay. um, but we also own a solicitor's practice as well. So um, every one of our clients and introducers who complete a case um, is invited to leave a review. Um, and the, the reviews are great to us, um, whether they're average, negative or positive. If they're negative, it gives us an opportunity to go back and learn and address the issues. And do you engage publicly <coughs> on those negative reviews? We do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's quite important, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. But we also gather reviews throughout the conveyancing process as well. So every email that goes out to a client, there's an opportunity for them to say whether they're feeling happy or sad. And if it Just generally in life or with... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with yeah, with us, yeah. Um, if they're feeling sad, then again, it's an opportunity for us to go back and say, you know, what are we doing bad? So Yeah. And that's, that's and I, presumably really useful for your feedback and your yeah. service, yeah. Absolutely. So um, we've only got actually a few minutes. The time has absolutely fly, flown by. Is there any other questions from the audience? I've got a couple of quick ones I can run through. But I wanted to go to, to you, Nathan, then on... Um, want to encourage you to get part in our unbundling pilot, but you actually do some stuff with unbundling services. So you do have an offer for a client who perhaps can't afford the full the full complete service, don't you? How does that, how does that work? Absolutely. So for us, uh, again, it's all part of meeting a client's needs. Uh, we do get clients who are on six figures who are happy to pay several hundred pounds an hour uh, because they know the service that they will get and they know the benefit of that. We have other clients who have lost their jobs, understandably, in employment law may not have been very well paid to start with and for me I want them to have access to justice as much as anyone else so we talk about very openly our cost in structures we talk about the fact that hourly rate is not going to suit you we give them a full rundown of what is needed let's say in an employment litigation case and how they can do certain parts themselves so for us it's about 
enabling clients, uh, allowing them the opportunity to reduce their costs. So we don't want to lose any clients at all. Um, our objective is to help everyone. So we, we do have a big uh, pro bono arm to the firm. I say arm, every single lawyer has a pro bono target. That's the only targets we have in the firm. No one has fee in a target. So everyone does their pro bono. And if someone comes through the door and they can't afford us, but that particular lawyer says, look, I really want to help them, do a pro bono. Absolutely fine. Great. Go for it. It's all part of profile raising for us. It's great marketing, frankly. And that lawyer gets to scratch their ethical itch which for me is, is a great way to keep lawyers and actually to attract new lawyers. Um, I don't want lawyers who want the, the largest salary that they can get because generally, frankly, they're not going to help the clients in the best way that I want them to. I want lawyers who got into law to help people who are altruistic by nature. And they're the lawyers that get attracted to a firm like mine who doesn't put uh, profit at the top, who's put the people at the top, who puts the purpose of the firm at the top. And in fact, Environmentally, we put the planet as well by, by in being a zero carbon uh, output and, and also planting trees for every client. So a very touchy-feely nice thing to do. Um, but, but from that perspective, yeah, every client has an opportunity to have some form of help from us, pro bono, initial free advice calls, or as we call it, menu pricing, which is you may be able to do these parts of the case yourself if you need a template schedule of loss, so you just fill in the gaps, then we can give that to you for a couple of hundred pounds, rather than spending five hours doing free and charging a thousand pounds. So uh, that, that's the way that we try to do it. And, and legal tech, I know we talked about it this morning, but legal tech really comes into it as well. Uh, and we are looking at different solutions at the moment where we can work with law centers and we can work with different law clinics uh, and anyone basically who needs that kind of service to make sure that again in employment law because that's my that's my bag um, we we enable people to help themselves as much as possible um, navigate what is a very complex and technical system which is employment law that's great I've got a couple of final questions one for Sarah one for Uzo and then we'll um, uh, I think we're gonna run out of time but Sarah I wanted to what law firms think clients want and what clients say they want or want isn't always the same is it or at least the research suggests that uh, yeah, um, so I think most law firms are very knowledgeable about their own clients, uh, but I think we all make assumptions about what people want from us sometimes. Um, the complaints data can often show that there is that mismatch in uh, what people are expecting and then what they actually receive, um, and whether, again, that comes just down to it wasn't communicated um, in the way that helped them understand it, um, and then um, I of often uh, look at the LexisNexis Bellwether reports. Um, there was one in 2016 that actually uh, looked at the, um, the, the difference in expectations um, and about what firms think clients want and what they actually want. Um, and top of the list for consumers, uh, which I doubt um, has changed very much, is they want their needs to be understood, uh, they want efficiency, they want good progress on the work and they want to be kept informed. Um, and clients thought top of the list was cost information, uh, have the needs understood, um, so there was similarity there, and then good customer service and easy to get in touch with. Um, our reasonable adjustments research that we did um, a year or two ago um, showed that the best way to understand people's needs, uh, whether that's about their case or whether it's providing reasonable adjustments uh, to people with disabilities, is to ask everybody, um, you know, what, what do you want from us? How do you want us to communicate? Um, and to really just make information clear and accessible, whether that's um, on your website, available in the office, to, to sort of cover the spectrum of, of different people's needs as, as far as is um, possible uh, within the, you know, the, the time and resources that you've got. Thank you, Sarah. And I had a question for you, Uzo, and there's probably the last question before I get everyone to finish up, was how important is it that the legal profession is diverse? The legal profession is perhaps more diverse than perhaps some other sectors, but there is still a way to go in terms of representation. Does it matter to clients, say, for instance, from different ethnic minority backgrounds, that someone perhaps who looks like them can offer them legal help, or is that, that relevant? Well, that's a huge plus for us. I think... Um, that is actually a selling point if you haven't got it on your website and you do recruit people from diverse ethnic backgrounds that is a big plus I remember individuals in um, a Swansea office particularly going to a law firm which they didn't even know 
if it was any good because they had a black partner and they felt that you have that social conscience, you are wanting to promote people and, and you know, give opportunities and have that shared space. I would say if you have diverse ethnic people, please pop it up and say that we particularly welcome people from all nationalities, all backgrounds on your website, whether you do have um, black, Asian or minority ethnic people or you don't, but just make a statement. It helps people who are, have experienced negativity with other firms where they feel that they can't approach you or approach your firm because nobody looks like them. I think that representation is critical, especially at the very senior levels, because often where you go to, I mean, in my work, I'm one of the uh, specialist policy advisors on equalities to Welsh government. And when uh, you walk into any kind of place, you just see black Asian people as potters or whatever. We want to see our community members right at the top because we believe that they are also doing as well as their white counterparts. It's a huge selling point. In fact, I know that the uh, diverse groups in the multicultural hubs, we have about five across Wales with over 300 and 300 uh, diverse ethnic groups and their representatives. They will promote you on their newsletters just because you are inclusive as a firm and the business that can come from, I mean like um, the Chinese community, they say in Swansea alone they have 2,000 families, many who have um, takeaway uh, restaurants, it's, you know, many of them um, spread the news. So this person has uh, an individual from China and that's really good to put money into that business and it will spread, you know. So if that is something that you have, not that you should recruit people on a tokenistic basis, but if you do um, have individuals who can contribute to your firm and you want to uh, get people from diverse ethnic groups, definitely put that on your website, that people are welcome from all nationalities, irrespective of their backgrounds, irrespective of their ability or religion and belief, everybody's welcome. That generic statement will make a huge difference. And, you know, here's to more clients because it's a business interest issue. Ultimately, you're not there to smile at people. You're there to help people and make money. So they have money to spend and you have the business to provide it. So it can be a win-win situation. Thank you. Although smiling, of course, helps, but it's a really in interesting <laughs> point. Right, I think we've run out of time, so I'm going to do the same thing that I did in the last session, and I'll start with you, Michael, is if perhaps in just one or two sentences, is there a big takeaway you'd like the audience to take from now, or, or perhaps some killer point you haven't made that you'd like to share? And we'll just go, we'll go back, along, back along the panel. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, from my perspective, I'd suggest that, you know, if you haven't already done so, uh, go and Google your, your firm's name and type the word reviews after it. Um, you know, this is what clients are doing. You know, we've got evidence of this. And, um, yeah, just have a look, see what pops up. It's important to make sure that, you know, if you think you've got a five-star reputation, that that's being portrayed um, in the way you want it to online. And definitely don't use Ask Jeeves. Um, so, Sarah, <laughs> what, 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 what's your final tip? Um, I think just about communication. Again, as I said at the start, managing people's expectations um, and uh, keep it, keeping people informed, um, and, and whether that's in a, a diverse um, way, uh, you know, using different methods um, of communicating with people, whether it's your, your website, um, using the, the web chats, um, etc. Um, and just, as they were saying earlier as well, trying these different things out to, to see what suits your, your clients and maybe not making um, assumptions of, of how you've always done things. Thank you, sir. Nathan? But yeah, I think one thing we haven't touched on is, is attracting the right lawyers. So um, everyone knows that it's your lawyers on the ground that help your clients, and they're the ones that are going to get the positive reviews. They're the ones that are going to enhance your business and get reputation um, and, and therefore clients through the door. So how do you attract the best lawyers at the moment? And Generation X and Generation Z that are coming through at the moment, their primary purpose is no longer money. Um, you will always have the people that will always go for the highest salaries, but for me, it's about attracting lawyers in a different way. So ultra law for us is about attracting altruistic lawyers, about grabbing people who sincerely got into law to help people and want to do that on a daily basis. Um, get rid of fee targets. Um, everyone is going to be doing a job. There's work there to be done. 
Um, if the work isn't being done, you're going to notice very soon. If you don't, then you need more supervision. But for us, it's having other and more important targets. You know, how many reviews have you had? Um, what do your clients actually say about you? And use it as a, as a natural way of building your business from the lawyers itself. So meet the client's needs, but remember who meets those client's needs. It's your lawyers. Give them everything they need to make the business work. You say the final word? Thank you. I think um, we've said quite a lot about what do consumers need. I think people from diverse ethnic backgrounds are really, really a missed opportunity. I think firms that are smart, are, are inclusive, and are reaching beyond the narrow confines of their current clientele to look at how can I be that um, inclusive, how can I go the extra mile? Don't put somebody in front of your firm to represent you if they don't believe in inclusion. Put them to the groups that they reach best. Put your best foot forward with black, Asian, and minority ethnic people because they will talk about it. They will say how poorly they were treated just as much as they'll go and give reviews that are positive if they've had a good one. If you know compassionate uh, uh, lawyers that you have, put them forward, let them win the hearts and minds of diverse communities. What people want is excellence in delivery of services. They want professionalism, they want answers, they want their matter sorted. And if you know the people to do that with the kindest of disposition, you're win-win all the way. And I do believe that just as uh, good news travels, bad news travels faster. So try not to put people mismatch because they are brilliant lawyers but don't have that interpersonal skills, especially with people who might not have English as a first language. Be that, um, you know, explore the concept that I say, like Tesco's. Those people have studied their clients. They know who shops there. And during Chinese New Year's Day, you come in, the first thing you see, showered spices and sauces and all the noodles are right in front and the Chinese will come in, they see all this red stuff. Wow, this is a place that we can shop. But is it really? They've just studied who their clients are and they're providing what you need. Same thing as when it's Indian Mela, you see all the Indian sh sauces out there. So make an effort to study who, what is the profile of the area that you're operating in and how can you best reach those communities. Put your best foot forward and have a successful business life and hope I never see you all in court <laughs> fighting racism issues. Yeah, but yeah, it's great to have wonderful law firms here in Wales and hope we continue to do, uh, if there any way we can promote your business, please get in touch with Race Council Cymru, I'm sure they will, or Black History Wales, it's on the website. We can share what you do with our community. Thank you, that's a great note to end on. Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to finish on, but first I wanted to thank um, the panel, if you could put your hands together. I think they've provided some really interesting insights, really great discussion. <laughs> just two or three things just to uh, wind up. Um, firstly, we talked about the importance of word of mouth. We want to hear your word of mouth on what you thought about this event. So you will be getting an email asking you to offer feedback that's the one thing we would ask. It'd be really helpful if you could do that because it helps us understand, was this helpful? Do you want to see more of this? Would you prefer if the chair had got locked on the balcony for the whole of the evening and didn't even do this? We want to know what you found it so we can, imp we can improve these things in the future. Um, secondly, also, we are doing some just videos to try and get feedback from people, what they think about innovation in the event upstairs. So if you could help with that, that would be brilliant. We are serving lunch upstairs love you to stay and have a chat if you can do obviously if you need to run off we don't mind at all but just wanted to say again a huge thank you for coming it's been great here to be in Cardiff today I've, I've learned a lot and hopefully you have as well and t you've got something useful to take away but otherwise thank you very much and have a good afternoon thank you